you see? Okay, I think we can see. You might see. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody want to say anything or ask a question about the film? One right here. Okay, yes. Sorry. Um, I have a question for the Cambodian gentleman. I've been to your country, uh, your lovely country, and I have been to the big killing field outside of Phnom Penh. It's about a half an hour where they have the big uh, craters, etc. Uh, my question is, in, in the LA Times in the last six months or so, they had, maybe in the last year or so, they had a, a, an article about a higher up Khmer Rouge man who had become a Christian. And he was being brought to trial and he had asked for forgiveness for his, he admitted, I don't know in how much detail, but he had admitted some of his wrongdoing and had asked for forgiveness. And I wondered what, how that played out, what the state of affairs of that is. Do you know? Yeah, I think, I think you're talking about somebody who's called Comrade Doik, who was the uh, chief of the prison of the in, uh, in, in Phnom Penh, where many of the people who were designed as a, designated enemies of the people okay. were brought and interrogated and uh, pretty much mostly killed. Right. And actually, some of the body, some of the, those terrible shots that you see at the end, the black and white shots, are from that prison. Right. Um, he has been on trial for about the last year, and his verdict is expected, I think, next week. Mm. So very soon, the, the judges will pass their verdict on, on his case. What and he will then be on trial again next year, and uh, Nunchir, brother number two, will be going on trial next year. That is the sort of the main trial in which um, we can expect perhaps uh, a little bit more uh, information to come out. Uh, certainly on the case of the trial of the prison chief, Dui, uh, there hasn't really been any, any explanation for, for, for what happened, just simply a kind of a recounting of, of, of what happened in that prison. Is that okay? Sure. Anybody else? Any, yes, another question there. Has the film been shown in Cambodia? No, it hasn't. No, although as you can imagine, um, in the last few days it's been exciting a huge amount of press interest there. Uh, although there was uh, a showing in Amsterdam just before Christmas. Um, quite when it will be shown in Cambodia, we're not quite sure. Uh, the court is very interested in having a, uh, a copy of the film. Of course, the film is not released yet. Um, and the reason why they're interested in having a copy of the film is that brother number two, Nun Chia, has actually said no comment to the court so far. Mm -hmm. So clearly this is quite a serious departure because of Sam Bat's work with him for the last 10 years. He's, he's said quite a lot more than no comment. So exactly how it will play in Cambodia and when we can release it and when we can show it uh, is to be determined. I think we have to tread carefully. There's lots of eggshells there. Yes. Are there so. any Cambodians who are motivated to understand this history and do something about it, or are there many who want to make it a thing of the past and forget it? Well, it's interesting that you say that because we showed the film on Sunday, uh, or not the film, but just a clip from the film, to um, the Cambodian community, or many, some members of the Cambodian community in Salt Lake City. And they came, the elder, the older people came to the, uh, to the show, we just showed a scene from, from it, the scene actually where the killers go back to the fields and they talk about how they felt about it all. They came in a very much a spirit of, well, we don't really want to know about this, and we're just extremely angry, and it's just, uh, you know, a kind of a feeling of blanking it all out. Younger people were coming also to that event and were interested in seeing it. But having seen that particular scene, the response of particularly the older people, uh, particularly the older women in the community was amazing. They actually said to Samba they wanted to go to Cambodia and embrace those killers and thank them for admitting their deeds and telling the truth after all these years. So, you know, I think that there's been 30 years of people trying to sort of maybe stop thinking about it, stop talking about it, but the film was kind of opening stuff up. And is there a difference between the Hmong and the Cambodian <coughs> nationals? Is there a difference between the... In the response from between the Hmong and the Cambodian nationals? Or the Hmong? Well, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many of them are actually in Cambodia, but no, we haven't, to be honest, because we just played it to one small group here in uh, Salt Lake City. Um, it was, it was, they were just all Cambodian people, lowland Cambodian people. Do you want to say anything? No, yeah, okay. Okay, we'll talk in a minute if you have some. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, are the truth tellers in jeopardy of being arrested as well? Um, they are probably too low down because the remit of the court is to arrest, is to try the most senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge and those most responsible for serious crimes. So that's what the United Nations sort of mandate is. Uh, the woman who appears in silhouette, sort of halfway through, there's a sort of bridge between the very top leadership of the command and the lower killers out in the field. She would be at risk. Right. And that's actually one was the reason why she didn't agree to appear and have her face shown. Right. Yes, it, over there. It seems you uncovered the reason why the, the traitors were killed, but didn't answer why the villagers were killed. Can you tell us why, why the villagers were killed? Comrade number two didn't answer that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really complicated thing. And obviously a film like this is just trying to tell a story. Uh, is uh, is uh, you know it is it is very difficult to to unpack that. Um, I think that what we try to show in this is that when the order to kill to, to find a to, to find a sort of a solution to a political problem is to say all right kill people who are you know a problem for us. That order gets passed down, and the identification of who is a problem gets passed down. And the jobs get generally kind of go further and further down this command line of command, and the multiplication of mistakes and obviously deaths uh, in the context of Cambodia as it was there, with a very secret and very intense sort of political kind of um, internal problems that the country had, uh, the, multi you know, the multiplication of those deaths and killings just becomes magnified by the. Uh, the, the, the handing down of the command, really. So I think, you know, we could talk for hours about it, about exactly the question that you asked. It's a really good question, but uh, it's, um, no, it's a good general. I think that's sort of a, a brief, a reasonable summary I would hope that I could give for that. So anybody else? Oh. Sorry. Yeah, we're here. Okay, yeah, so, again, I'm sorry, we can't see. So anyone who, Yes, I'm waving, you're waving your hand. Yes, yeah. the, the lady there. I'd love to know how the two of you found each other and why somebody decided to share years of research and such careful cultivation of these people that you wanted to get their stories from. Why did you, why did you uh, bring in Rob? That, why did you start working? Okay, so I'll just talk briefly from my point of view and then hand it to Sam. But I just went to Cambodia in 2006, planning to do a trial, a film about the trial, planning to see if you could sort of film with the three leaders of the Khmer Rouge and get everything from them as they sort of gradually came approach justice. The two of them, the other two that we saw, really had nothing to say and uh, and, and really were um, quite not involved. I think in kind of very high level decisions. <clears throat> the most interesting person was Nun Chia, brother number two. And when I got to Phnom Penh the first time in 2006, it became clear that the only way you could go and see brother number two uh, and have any hope of uh, sort of continued time with him was with Sambat. And then originally we started off as a kind of a kind of rather traditional Western journalist or producer with a fixer going off to see this person. And we got there and brother number two really said absolutely nothing. And it was, it felt like that we were, there was no kind of, uh, uh, there, was no, there was no mileage in going, in going down this route. But on the way back, Sambat told me about how he had been working with him for so many years. And he then showed me some of the tapes and interviews that he'd done with him. And I began to realize that actually it was in the relationship between them Sambat and brother number two, and Sambat and the other killers that he'd managed to sort of find all around. It was in that kind of relationship between them and, uh, and him that maybe we could get at some of that very, very sort of secret truth that I'd been interested in. And so I asked him if he would be my kind of equal partner in making the, this film. 
And, um, and that's how we decided to proceed from there on. That was sort of three years ago. And I'll just let Sambat say maybe a comment on it. Thank you for the question. And at the beginning, before I start the uh, research about Camargo, as you know, I am uh, one of the uh, victims and also my family. Also, as men said, in film were killed and died, and I did not include my uh, uncle, five uncle were killed too. Those uncle, they are the brother of my mother and, uh, and my father, but I did not mention in the film, yes. So, not only my family, many Cambodian people died and killed, so the history here in Khmer Rouge from 75 to 79 is very dark and uh, hidden, no, no anything that uh, can tell the people the truth, why they are killing and who did it, and why so the accusation and suspicion among the Cambodian people always go around. So that's why all the people feeling is uh, not, until today, their feeling is no good because they don't understand, but we could be a relative, many were killed and died too. So that's why I read many books too. Uh, uh, many historians know it about the Khmer Rouge uh, in English and Khmer, but uh, it doesn't make me understand, uh, make me uh, think why they are killing. So because the reason that they had no body admit that they kill the people, they order killing the people. Because of all this reason, I had started research by my own self uh, to, do, uh, to find out about the truth. Because I hope that I am a Cambodian, so I could talk to these people and I could get all uh, this problem. And one more thing, I, I had one idea that the killing and death of Cambodian people is not, uh, there are something behind all of this problem. So it's not a, uh, a small problem. That's why I think there are something behind it. That's why no anything come out. <coughs> and then that's why I can uh, later I, I can get through to uh, brother number two. And uh, later on I can get through to the, uh, I can say that like a killer, yes. And I talk to many, uh, I can say you know, right now I have more than 100 killers that uh, they faithfully talk to me. The reason that they talk to me because I know from uh, some uh, talk to my reflector, they point out who killed people who did a bad thing. That's why I, I know the name and their identification, their location. But the problem location is not easy for me to, to find them because uh, their former resident always changing because they were worried that they would be remain or kill them. That's why they moved too far away, like 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers from the uh, Former resident. So thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Two. Right here. Oh, three more questions. In right. Yes. yes. Okay. Question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Right. Mr. Right. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Red next. Then. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Sambat, when you were in the process of doing this research and getting to the bottom of the whole thing, meeting all these people, getting them to talk to you, did you feel that you were healed, that you were getting feeling better after the terrible childhood that you'd had and all that had happened to your family? Yeah, after those people, they confessed, told me the truth, really it made me uh, feel better because if those people do not tell me the truth, so I feel very bad, yes? uh, made me still sad. But after they told me the truth about that and confession faithfully to me, and then, okay, I forgive to them and I feel better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to review some real brief history with you. As I recall during the Vietnam War, the Khmer Rouge were helpful to the United States in uh, fighting against the Vietnamese. Is that correct? Yeah, that is, uh, that is after 1979. Before, uh, in 1975 to 79, uh, in January 29, the Khmer is uh, in cooperation with China. 
but uh, China and Viet, uh, Cambodia and Vietnam are not together. So there are issues. And then China, uh, Vietnam and Russia, they are together. And then China become a bit commercial. So this time they are clash each other from 75 to 79. So after that, in, 70, in 1979, yes, after January, the Khmer Rouge collapsed. Uh, that's the question about the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's why US coming to uh, help Cambodian people along the border, and then uh, like a big sushi can or big asylum to Cambodian in US or in other country. So that's all. What's the relationship between Vietnam and Cambodia today? What's the relationship between Vietnam and Cambodia today? Yeah, so now they are very, very good relationship because the group, the, the current government leader right now, they are former Khmer Rouge, and they are the one group who became proposed uh, from 75 to 79. So that's why they are, they are go together in good cooperation. Yes. So just to underline that, that's the current government of, Khmer, of Cambodia is basically run by people who were in the other side of the, uh, the opposing faction within the Khmer Rouge, and that's why it's taken 30 years to bring uh, brother number two and so on to, to trial. Uh, was there one more question? Yes, sorry. I'm interested in some of history from the refugee camp in so Sam, but how from, from the refugee camp in Thailand, how did you, what was the journey to becoming a journalist? So when I, after World uh, College, and then uh, as you know, I had no parents, nobody feed me. So that's why I, I heard information that uh, the UN, uh, they has uh, opened a camp, uh, allow Cambodian refugee to live there and then provide a ride to eat and school, something like that. That's why I must uh, go to the refugee camp along the border. That, and later I had go to, uh, I had learned English language in the camp and finally I got a job in uh, American Refugee Committee. And after that I worked for, like, I don't know, I could not remember for four years, maybe year two. And then I moved to work uh, as a teacher for UNTAP who come to uh, Work in Cambodia during 1993, we call uh, uh, United Nations uh, Transitional Authority. And after that, uh, in 1995, yes, and then I moved to be a journalist. Because at the beginning, I don't think that uh, uh, I just like a professional journalism, but I, I, I don't think that I'm not a perfect one. Uh, especially, I think that maybe I write, uh, I join in the newspaper. I hope that my English will get better and better. Yes. I don't think that I'm deeply in a journalist of mind at the time. But after two years, become journalist, it made me deep uh, in too interesting. It made me to be a real journalist. I don't think it's not a real one, just to be in English. But after two years, uh, it made me to get on, get on. Like I tried to use uh, as a reporter, like one month and two months at the beginning. And I told my wife that, oh, I will stop working at journalism. But she told me that, oh, you should continue it. And then finally, after two years, made me too interested. I think that the journalism is very important. That's why because of uh, my uh, knowledge uh, from journalism, that's why I can uh, help me how to research. Uh, that's why we can talk and get all this information for today. So thank you. And I would like to say, say that we are all here very lucky that to see these people. For Cambodian people who are the victim, they do not see these people yet. So I hope that if those people, the Cambodian people can see these people, I hope that they, they can uh, give a fair judgment. Mm -hmm. or I hope that they will feel better too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.